This is episode 11 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 22 2.2. The Economy. The economy can be looked at through a variety of lenses, but one of the most basic divides it into three sectors. The primary sector has to do with resource extraction. Everything from logging, mining, and drilling to farming and fishing belong in this category, as well as basic alterations to prepare materials for shipment or use. The secondary sector is responsible for producing finished goods from the raw materials. Factories, mills, and cottage industries all contribute to this sector. The tertiary sector is also called the service industry and encompasses financial concerns, education, government, healthcare, entertainment, waste management, and so on. As countries quote unquote progress, their economies move from an emphasis on the primary and secondary sectors to the tertiary. In today's economy, individuals hold specialized positions in a long and integrated production line, but this often deprives us of a sense of accomplishment. Much in the same way that an auto worker who tightened a single bolt on each truck that was assembled in a factory might not have a sense of pride in what he or she was producing, many of us are such small cogs and giant machines and do not feel ownership over what we do. Furthermore, most jobs are so far removed from fulfilling our basic needs and desires that they are mere abstractions. Service sector jobs especially can absorb an infinite amount of hours from their employees, and many people are induced to work more than the quote-unquote standard 40 hours each week. This is not the only way to run an economy. It's entirely possible that we could reorganize our economy so that each person can be involved in a wider variety of tasks, perhaps even working in each of the three sectors. This may sound like a regression, but human beings are not made to perform a single task every day for their entire lives. If anything, industrialized work appears to be an aberration. Not only would people benefit from variety in their workday, they would also feel a greater proprietorship over what they produce. Furthermore, if we were able to provide for even a few of our own needs directly through our labor, it would increase our sense of fulfillment. Finally, by diversifying our individual skill sets, we'll be able to create a wider variety of solutions to new problems, which allows us to be adaptable to changing conditions. By producing for ourselves, it frees us from being obligate consumers. That is, in our current system, even farmers must buy their food at the grocery store. Although many people pride themselves on self-sufficiency, we have built a system that is overly dependent on far-flung resources transported by fossil fuels. Take that cheap fuel source away, and the entire scheme collapses. By diversifying ourselves, we will soften this blow. End of chapter. Chapter 23. The Monopoly Man. Winter, 2015 to 2016. Thanks for agreeing to my experiment, guys. Eva looked at the three sitting around her kitchen table. They had just finished eating dinner and were cleaning the remnants of apple crumble off their plates. Note, inspired by Ansem's and Greenan, 2012, and the TED Talk from Piff, 2013. End of note. I haven't played Monopoly in years, Jason said through a forkful of dessert. That makes two of us, Lauren said. If we can, I want to play twice, each time with a different set of rules. Josh looked at his watch. I've barely gotten through one game of Monopoly in a sitting. I'm, g- I'm game for two, but you had better put on another pot of coffee. Others nodded in agreement. It probably won't take that long with these new rules, Eva said. Let's get this table cleared and we'll get started. Everyone pitched in to clear the table, wash the dishes, and brew tea and coffee. Eva spread her Monopoly board out on the table. Geez, how old is this? My parents got it when they were dating, so pretty old, but it still has all its cards. Now, the first game will be a tweaked version of the usual game. We'll start by rolling to put us in rank order from highest to lowest. Each person gets an envelope with their assets to start the game. Let's see here. Eva rolled a 7 and passed the dice to Jason, who rolled an 11. Lauren just beat out Eva with an 8, and Josh, to his chagrin, rolled snake eyes. Eva distributed the envelopes according to their ranking, and each player started to lay out their assets. Josh was surprised to find only a slip of paper in his envelope. What the hell is this, he said, eyeing Jason, who was putting a house on Boardwalk and Pennsylvania Avenue. We haven't even started yet? Jason has houses and I have a bill for $500? That's not a bill, said Eva. It's your debt. In this version, we can each go into debt if we can't pay for something. We don't have to mortgage our properties like the original game, but your wages are garnished at 50% until your debt is paid off. You have a sheet to keep track of your debt. You can only use your debt to pay off rents, not to buy properties. 
But why is Jason placing houses? asked Lauren. He inherited those properties, Eva said. He also inherited some wealth. He's starting with double the usual cash, so that should be about $3,000. Lauren, you have the usual amount, $1,500. I have nothing, and Josh is $500 in debt. This is horseshit, said Josh. Ah, come on. It was all luck of the roll. Jason stifled a grin. Oh, I forgot to mention, Eva said. The wealthiest player gets the added bonus of always rolling as if they got doubles. That is, rolling twice. The poorest only gets one die to roll. This can change through the game, though, so look out. Let's start. Everybody picked a token? Each player put their token on go. Jason had picked the top hat, Lauren the Scotty Dog, Eva the Thimble, and Joss took the shoe, saying that he thought he was going to be the heel of this game anyway. Jason picked up the dice, rolled a six, and bought Oriental Avenue. He rolled again and landed on the electric company, which he also bought. Lauren rolled an eight and bought Vermont Avenue. Josh rolled a six, maxing out his single die. Jason raised a fist and then rubbed his hands together. Yes, time to pay the piper. So I guess I owe Jason $30? Right, Ava said. Note it down on your sheet, and I, the bank, will give Jason $30. Jesus, this is not going to go well, said Josh. You look like Monty Burns right now. Jason steepled his fingers. Excellent. Over the next half hour, Jason flew around the board, passing go twice as often as everyone else, four times faster than Josh with his single die. He bought and developed the majority of the properties, utilities, and railroads, in most cases creating monopolies. Lauren was keeping afloat with a couple of properties, a few lucky rolls, and excellent chance cards. Josh, and to a lesser extent Ava, had sunk deep into debt. Because they could never buy a property, their only income was passing go, getting a lucky chance card or landing on the community chest. Eva was only doing better than Josh because she could still roll two dice. After about a half hour, Josh had had enough. I vote that we declare Jason the winner and try the next set of rules. No way, said Jason, glassy-eyed. Let's see how this turns out. I have a feeling things are going to turn around for you, buddy. Look, I'll even forgive half of your debt. What would that bring you to? Uh, negative 4,530? But I I really don't want to do that. It's clear you're going to win. So why prolong everyone else's misery? I just plod around the board, giving you money that I'll never be able to pay back. Them's the rules. I didn't make them. I just follows them. Eva and Lauren exchanged glances. Josh was starting to get visibly upset. You're only winning because you started out with huge advantages. Maybe, but I also played a lot of Monopoly growing up. I know the good properties to buy, I knew when to develop them, so maybe I started out with a leg up, but I did the rest for myself. Lauren, who had been quiet for much of the game, threw up her hands. Seriously? Don't you see that this is just a microcosm of our own economy and you're playing the part of the super wealthy? You act arrogantly, you take advantage of others, and you think it's all due to your own ability when it's almost entirely a result of your initial advantage? Aaron pointed to Lauren. Bingo. We just recreated a study done at Berkeley, and Jason played right into the stereotypical behaviors of the privileged. I mean, you're really a perfect example. You even went and got a bag of chips from my pantry and started eating them without asking or offering to share. Jason had at first looked angry, but now slowly pulled his hand out of the chip bag, looking contrite. Chips, anyone? He offered the bag to the others at the tables. Everyone laughed. Now that you mention it, I do see it. When we were playing, though, I just had blinders. I was so caught up in the game that I didn't even realize how ridiculous my winning was. I mean, I could feel my heart going fast every time it got to be my turn. That's nuts. Eva took a chip. It's not your fault. People are just fairly predictable. You doing okay, Josh? Yeah, it's cool, said Josh through a mouthful of chips. That's some pretty underhanded social engineering, though, Eva. Yeah, our economy is pretty much a big nasty game. So should we try it again with uh, better rules? Everyone nodded their consent and cleaned up the board, all while giving Jason sarcastic compliments on his skillful gameplay. The second set of rules is a bit more communal, Eva said. Everyone either wins or loses together. Ah, now the dirty commie pinko version, asked Jason. Eva gave him a glare. Sure, if you think that's what it means when everyone wins together. Jason rolled his eyes. At any rate, nobody owns the properties here. We must each have a place to live, so instead of being deeds, the property cards represent a long-term lease agreement. Each time we pass go, we pay half of the stated rent to the bank. We can vote to add houses or hotels to our rental properties as a group. The improvements are financed by taking a chunk out of our wages for pass and go. For example, if we all add houses, the cost is 400 then we'll each lose 100 on our next go-round. Obviously, the utilities are publicly owned. Sounds straightforward, But do we get to roll as individuals, or do we have to vote on moving? Lauren smirked. No matter the system, there is chance inherent in life, so yes, we'll each roll individually. With that, the group started moving around the board. Jason had a rented property on his first turn and landed on another one in his second. Should I rent two properties, he asked? You can, Eva said, but you'll be paying two rents out of your wages each time you pass go. Well, that seems stupid. What's going to happen to all the unrented properties, he asked. Josh shrugged. What needs to happen to them? Jason leaned back in his chair. Boring. The game continued for a few rounds. 
After the third lap, everyone voted to put hotels on their rental properties. The improvements were financed after a few more rounds, but by now everyone was bored of the game. Okay, I, I get what you're trying to do, Eva, Lauren said, but this gets to be really dull. This is why your lefties' economies stink, said Jason. Josh shook his head. To be fair, this is just a part of life, right? It's only real estate. We don't even touch on the jobs or other parts of the economy. Even nodded. Economy should be boring. Why would you want to make the economy, healthcare, education, or other things like the lottery, and a rigged lottery at that? Yeah, housing should be boring. And since we all need shelter, it shouldn't be something that someone uses to exploit others to get rich. Of course the cost should be covered. But the profit motive makes people pretty nasty, right Jason? Jason rolled his eyes. Now that this game is boring, should we do something else with the time freed up from worrying about buying real estate? The group unanimously agreed to move on to play Pandemic, a game that simulates a worldwide disease outbreak that the players must work together to cure. End of chapter. Chapter 24, 2.2.1. Banking and Finance. We are too enamored with the gross domestic product. Something is perversely wrong with a measurement wherein a traffic accident that totals a car is seen as a positive because of vehicle replacement and medical costs. All too often, economists present our system as if it is a game that we all must play. When the numbers go up, we're doing well. When they fall, it's a catastrophe. We recognize that stable systems in nature are just that. Stable, not growing or shrinking. Infinite growth is impossible in a finite world. To put it another way, our economy runs on an empty world model, in which inputs and outputs are seen as infinite. The economist Herman Daly contrasts this with the full world model, which recognizes that the world has finite resources. Note. Daly, 1996. End of note. It would force the economy to deal with the unwanted byproducts and unexpected effects, such as pollution and land degradation. Large corporations would have to recognize the ramifications of their actions on all of the population and environment, not just their shareholders. In the same vein, Derek Jensen, an activist best known for his campaign against hydroelectric dams, recounted that, quote, Canadian lumbermen have a great line. When I look at a tree, I see dollar bills. If all you see when you look at a tree is dollar bills, then you're going to look at them one way. If you look at trees and see trees, you're going to see them another way. It doesn't matter if we're talking about trees or fish or women. If I look at women and see orifices, I'm going to treat them one way. If I look at this particular woman and see a particular woman, I'll treat her differently. How we perceive the world affects how we behave in it, and this culture has systemically driven us insane. End of quote. Note. Quoted in McCann, 2010, page 110. End of note. In the same way, if we see the Earth as just a big pile of resources waiting to be exploited, we'll view it in an unsustainable way. We must link this lust for resource acquisition to the all-consuming desire for wealth. We understand that from an intellectual perspective, most people link wealth to having their needs and desires met and would argue that this is the root of their quest to accumulate money. This belief is so pervades our society, however, that money has become fetishized. It is imbued with value, as if it were a real thing. Alan Watts, better known for his popularization of Buddhist philosophy, sums up the absurdity of money. Quote, Remember the Great Depression of the 30s? One day, there's a flourishing consumer economy with everyone on the up and up, and the next, unemployment, poverty, and bread lines. What happened? The physical resources of the country, the brain, brawn, and raw materials, were in no way depleted, but there was a sudden absence of money, a so-called financial slump. Complex reasons for this kind of disaster can be elaborated at length by experts on banking and high finance who cannot see the forest for the trees. But it was just as if someone had come to work on a building a house, and on the morning of the Depression, the boss had said, Hey baby, sorry, we can't build today. No inches. What do you mean, no inches? We got wood, we got metal, we even got tape measures. Yeah, but you don't understand business. We've been using too many inches, and there's just no more to go around. End quote. Note. Watts, 1986, page 6. End of note. In other words, money is a measurement, a yardstick. A final component of our financial economy that must be jettisoned is the idea that companies exist to create a profit and those that run companies can be shielded from their bad decisions. We have taken this mistake so far that business leaders are more likely to be sued for not turning a profit than for reneging on pensions, cutting corners on worker safety, or ignoring environmental regulations. And even then, it is the company that would be liable, not the person making the decision. In a new economy, organizations should exist to produce goods for the benefit of their customers and employees, but not for mindless profit-seeking. If greed was not the underlying incentive, a worker-run, not-for-profit cooperative could certainly churn out quality materials, goods, and services without sacrificing the health and safety of the employees or general public. Money may still be a useful tool for comparing the relative value of items, though, and some communities may experiment with different economic systems on a local scale. 
The most effective practices can be shared for everyone's benefit. For example, prices might be reckoned by strictly adding the cost that went into producing an item. A loaf of bread could be priced by adding the cost of flour, water, yeast, and salt, material inputs, plus the overhead cost, rent, utilities, and repairs of the bakery divided by number of loaves produced, plus labor, baker, and staff salaries divided by number of loaves produced. Markup and profit are unnecessary because the costs are covered. Essentially, an at-cost economy would benefit everyone more equitably than the so-called free market, which inordinately benefits the wealthy. End of chapter. End of episode 11 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com. <laughs>